When you hear these men talking about pornography, the things they say seem almost unbelievable. But if you listen, it's clear that these guys are only demonstrating exactly what social scientists have been finding. Pornography does, in fact, affect the male attitude towards sex, and especially towards women. And because hardcore pornography has now become so mainstream and legitimized, some men don't even mind talking about it on camera. There is no arguing the fact that pornography is a hotly debated issue in America today. On the one hand, there are those who believe pornography is harmful to their community and should be censored, which of course offends those who believe that any censorship violates freedom of speech, a freedom we as Americans hold dear. Widening the divide even further was the controversial interview with serial killer Ted Bundy. And, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. Bundy's claim that pornography influenced his behavior ignited a huge debate over whether there is a cause and effect relationship between pornography and sexual violence. Today, pornography is more pervasive than ever from the neighborhood video store to your home computer. When did it all start? Up until the 50s, pornography was shunned, a back alley taboo. But in 1953, something happened that would challenge and ultimately change the way Americans felt about sexually explicit material. If you want to talk about what happened in the pornography industry, we have to point to the late, later months of 1953 when Playboy hit the stands. And what happened is Playboy changed the nature of pornography in the Western world. Prior to Playboy, pornography was the under-the-counter, um, low-class, it had an image of being associated with low-class males. And anyone, any male who wanted to buy it was ashamed about buying it. It was in a brown paper bag. He had to find outlets for it. What Hugh Hefner did in December 1953 when he introduced pornography into the market was he made it respectable. He gave it an upper middle class aura. And he did this very purposely. When you read about Playboy and you read about Hefner and how he intended to sell Playboy, he sold it as a lifestyle magazine, but as an upper middle class life mag lifestyle magazine. So what he says, for example, in the first Playboy in 1953 was, um, the playboy enjoys his cocktails, he likes to listen to music, he likes to talk about philosophy, he likes Picasso. This was a coded way of saying that the new playboy, the new guy who consumes pornography, is no longer this low-class guy who scurries in dirty passages or dirty alleyways. What he is, is this upper middle-class male who will consume this magazine which tells him how to dress, uh, what to wear, what to buy, what to eat and also the pictures, and the pictures were tagged on in selling it to the reader because the reader did not want to see himself as a pornography user. The reader wanted to see himself as an upwardly mobile male who would consume this magazine in order to know how to have the Playboy lifestyle. And what happened between 1969 and 1974 was a battle between Playboy and Penthouse of who could produce the most explicit magazine. Penthouse won. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, the end of the, that sort of war between the two magazines was 1974, the very time that Hustler published their first um, issue. And it's no accident, because what the battle between Playboy and Penthouse did, in terms of opening up the pornography, was it pushed the limits of what was acceptable, and what was acceptable to be distributed through the mainstream channels. And so you could buy it in kiosks, you could buy it in airports. Prior to the 60s, you couldn't do that. And that's what has made it such a multi-billion dollar a year industry. So Playboy, Penthouse and Hustler, together, as a group, worked to push the limits of what's acceptable. Without these key people, you would not have the industry you've got today. They laid the legal, the economic and the cultural groundwork for this multi-billion dollar industry we now have. Since the late 1970s, the pornography industry has exploded into a multi-billion dollar a year business. They have exploited every form of communication there is in order to take it out of the back alley and bring it directly into your home. 90% of all neighborhood video stores have a section for soft and hardcore pornography tapes. Cable and satellite deliver pornography directly to the home. A new trend in the adult bookstore industry is the large outlet chain store usually in the heart of a suburban neighborhood. Behind me is an 18,000 square foot porn store called Castle Superstore. Castle boasts that it's going to have 500 stores nationwide in the next five years. 
and they say that they're mainstreaming pornography to the public. The internet has made all types of hardcore and illegal pornography available to anyone with a computer and a modem. Well, we did a survey um, a, a year and a half ago with MSNBC. It was the biggest survey ever done with internet sexuality, and we found a, a, a number of very important findings. One of the findings was the significant percentage of people who were developing sexual problems with, in their online sexual usage. And this had never been quantified before. And what we found was that 1% in a very conservative definition of people had very serious problems with online sexual compulsivity or addiction. And up to 15% of people had some degree of problems with their online sexual usage. Now, even the conservative definition of 1%, when you think about 20 million people in the U.S. go online for sexual pursuits, 1% of that is 200,000 people with severe sexual problems with the Internet. We think that's an epidemic. It's an epidemic that's unrecognized, and it's something that really needs attention. I'll be at my house, and my little brother's on the computer, and he'll be...